Just to set the scene, as we know, Jesus was executed on Friday. He was buried by tea time, sealed in a grave, in a tomb, and then the following Sunday morning, the tomb was found to be empty. And over a period of 40 days, Jesus was seen by various people. And then it was time for him to return to heaven, to his Father in heaven, which Christians call the Ascension. And just before he ascended, he said to his closest friends, his apostles, don't do anything, just wait in the city until I send the Holy Spirit upon you. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Peter and the apostles hit the streets of Jerusalem and told people what God had done in and through Jesus Christ. And a few months later, a church was forming, mostly made of Jewish Christians, but many thousands of people without buildings, without any formal church leadership or so ever. And so we're going to read now a very early account of what the church, the very first church, was like. It was so different, don't think of buildings and congregations, but a body of people that had given their lives to follow Christ. Page 1094, thank you. So Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We get this picture of this fellowship. They didn't have, as I said, they didn't have a building to meet. They went and met in the temple, um, in the outer courts, because that was a convenient place and big enough for them to go to. And they met together and they prayed and they ate together. They broke bread, which we now sort of remember, in a sense, with the Holy Communion service. And they looked after each other. People were selling stuff so that the poor people had money to buy food and so on. And there was a lot going on. It wasn't just a, a nominal thing. It was taking over their lives. And remember, of course, they were meeting on Sunday, which in our context would be Monday, because the Jews' holy day was Saturday, and Sunday they returned to work again. So they had to sort of put themselves out a little bit to, to do all this good stuff. But every time I read this passage, there's a little niggle in my mind, and it's this verse that says, a deep sense of awe came over them all. Sorry, a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. This little phrase, tucked in that description of the early church, is quite a challenge to us today. We live in a culture that elevates reason above the supernatural. People are largely skeptical about miraculous signs and wonders. And of course, miraculous signs and wonders, by definition, are hard to explain by reason. But we get here a very clear hint 
that right from the beginning, the early church practised signs and wonders, as we call them. In fact, they not only practised them, when they were gathered together, they prayed that prayed to God that wonders would accompany their ministry. And the reason was because these wonders got the attention of those who were uninterested in the gospel. I mean, at one point in his life, Jesus was so inundated with people coming to him to be healed that he had to kind of hide away. And then people still found him and discovered where he was hiding and still brought sick people to be healed. It got their attention and then he would be able to explain just who God was and about God's kingdom. If you could just turn in your Bible, if you've still got it open, to chapter 4, verse 23. Keep it open around Acts because we'll be looking at a couple of passages. Peter and John have been arrested for what they've been doing and the Jewish council, known as the Sanhedrin, had kind of stuck them in jail. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod, who was the king at the time, and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen, that is, to kill Jesus. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. And here's the prayer. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the holy name of your servant Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. What an exciting church to belong to. And when we go out to evangelise or whatever, it's great when God reveals himself in some unmistakable way. And it doesn't matter if we're not a Christian or if we are a Christian, it's always an encouragement. Somehow it takes us out of the realm of, well, just complacency and indifference to the realm of where God is real. For myself, I grew up in the Church of England well, you know what I mean. I went to Sunday school from the, as far back as I can remember. But it wasn't for quite a number of years before I was filled with the Spirit and then the great sense that came upon me was, God is real. I could quote you what God had done. I could quote you stuff from Jesus. I could quote you passages from the Bible. But at that moment, God became real. Now, I'm not saying that signs and wonders replace the preaching or the proclamation of the gospel. I'm not saying that at all. But they do help open people's minds to the good news. And if you turn through to Acts 13, we'll read a, quickly an example of that. Acts 13 and verse 4. Now this is Paul and Barnabas, two great apostles who were going out and they ended up in Cyprus. So that's the two. The two of them, 
sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, there he creeps in again, the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed there from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues, and John was with them as their helper. Uh, that John is the one that wrote Mark's Gospel. He was known as John Mark. They travelled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet, prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. So this man attended the top man on the island. Now then, listen to this. The proconsul was an intelligent man. He sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. Now this is kind of a bit disquieting to us. You are going to be blind and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. What a dramatic example of how the proconsul became a Christian. But there is the facts of the gospel remain supreme. But God worked in such an unmistakable way through the Holy Spirit that the proconsul was in no doubt about the reality of God. And, rea and the re reality of the God being proclaimed by Paul and Barnabas. So, the word of God, but God uses miracles as well. Now, God is sovereign, a word that often creeps up in our songs and uh, prayers and so forth. And because he's sovereign, he can give whatever gifts he wants to whoever he wants, whenever he wants to. So, not everyone necessarily works in the miraculous realm. Some may work in it often, some just perhaps once in their life. However, too many of us do suffer from sign and wonder phobia. For some reason we're afraid of it. And there's all sorts of reasons we may be that we feel out of control that I might pray for somebody and nothing happens and then I look stupid. There's all sorts of reasons for being afraid. But the real reason, of the root of all the others, is really a lack of faith in believing that God could use me or he could use you in that way. And so it's easier to duck out, to keep quiet, than perhaps take that step forward and to do the thing that perhaps the Holy Spirit's nudging you to do. But somehow you have that lack of faith that he can use you in that way. And we can cover that up. We can be sort of, you know, well, it's, I don't want to push myself forward because I'm such a humble person. But sometimes we do have to be bold and step out. We live in a world which is very much controlled by what the Bible refers to as the sinful nature. Look at Saddam. Look at the mess that the Scottish National Party's in. 
Look at the issues with Ukraine. Look at the lack of care that we have for our people as they need care, particularly those who grow elderly. Everywhere you look, it seems to be that everybody's working to some sort of schism and scheme and it's just sort of wicked and evil. There's the whole PC thing, the whole fact that there's 73 genders somehow. And people are kind of being thrown out by what is going on. But according to St Paul, Christians are unique. And they're unique because they are controlled by the Holy Spirit. God's presence dwelling within them. And Christians are unique too because they're very different. Their outlook, their views of the world, their value system is very, very different. And at root, the reason for that is because Christians are actually citizens of another world. They're citizens of heaven who happen to be living here on earth now. And it's good to always remember that, that in fact, in a sense, we're in an alien world. We're ambassadors sent from heaven by God, empowered through his presence within us, to show people what heaven on earth looks like. Just before he left his, his apostles, his closest friends, Jesus gave them what we call the Great Commission. And that was simply, go and make disciples. And the word, the key word there is disciple. Make disciples. To be a disciple is costly, and it's radical. Jesus told people that if they wanted to be his disciples, to be people that follow him, they've got to be able to deny themselves. And first and foremost, follow and do where he leads and what he leads them to do. In other words, deny themselves and serve him. So we get now a hint when we are told to go and make disciples that it's about making people who are prepared to deny themselves and become like Jesus himself in their character and in some of the things that he did. And that's Jesus' plan to grow the church and within a few weeks and months of his leaving the earth and returning to heaven, that plan was operating just as Jesus said. And it was operating big time. The very first day the disciples hit the streets of Jerusalem, 3,000 people became Christians. So the church went from about 120 to 3,000 in one day. And it was on the up and up and up when we look at our Acts 2 church. So that was Jesus' plan to grow the church so that others can be part of God's kingdom and receive all the benefits, short and long term, that goes with that. So go and make disciples. And that has two aspects, evangelism and discipleship. Evangelism is bringing people to the faith and discipleship is how they grow in that faith and helping them to do that. Just looking at evangelism, and it often has two components. We talk of presence and presentation. Presence is about being salt and light, taking God's love out into a hurting world and at its best 
It's about loving our neighbour as ourself. So being present where people are hurting, particularly, or misguided. And presentation is about presenting the claims of the gospel, telling people what it is, what it's all about. And you probably, some of you are familiar with things like the Alpha Course and Christianity Explored and such things. So that's how the gospel could be presented. And we have heard about Dozy going out, presenting the gospel <coughs> to people at their door. And presentation, is this mine? Thanks. Presentation is often about reason. So, for most, when they think of evangelism, it's about love and it's about reason. However, we see in the Acts 2 church that they had a third ingredient to their mission, and that was God's power. That power was the supernatural demonstration which we call signs and wonders. So for the Acts 2 church, the key ingredients to evangelism were love, reason, and God's power. If you like, three Ps, presence, presentation, and power. In Acts 19, verse 8, it says there, uh, we, we get an example of presentation and power. Um, power evangelism. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. The way was the early church comes from the way to God. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years, so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. This is the crunch. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. I mean, it's, for us it probably sounds a little bit unbelievable and it was to people until it happened to them and then they had a transformation like no other. And of course we know that when we look at Jesus, our prime example, that Jesus proclaimed God's kingdom clearly and confidently in the power of the Holy Spirit. So is it time? Is it time for us to repent of our neglect and to embrace the full ministry of the Holy Spirit with all his gifts. Because if you think about it, if God is God, and he is, then he's going to do supernatural things. And here's a slight twist in the story. Ironically, as it happens at the moment, that many postmodern people are becoming more aware of spiritual things in the broad sense of the word. They may have weird spiritual things like crystals and stones and hanging CD discs up in trees and so forth. But there is some sense that there is more 
to this life than at first appears. And that's just ripe for power evangelism. Presence evangelism may soften people's hearts, make it, making it easier for them to receive the gospel. But it's always God's power that's needed for conversion. And that just may be flipping somebody's mind to see the reality of God. It may be something dramatic, like somebody being healed of something life-threatening. But power is about being a channel for the Holy Spirit to work through. Now, I'm not saying that we're all going to be amazing Christians and do all these amazing things. What I am saying is that it would be great if more of us were like a hosepipe. And the hosepipe, if you think what it does, we connect it to a tap, which is a source of water, and we point the other end of the hose to some poor little plant that's dying of drought, and we turn on the tap, the water comes through the pipe and waters the plant, and the plant, hay can grow again and come to life, or a seed comes into a plant or whatever. And perhaps we've been hose pipes in the past, but we've got filled with cobwebs and snails have crawled up inside and blocked it, it's got a bit kinky or whatever. So I'm just saying, when I say repent, perhaps we've got to clean ourselves out and take out the kinks. And we're no more than a hosepipe. So God gets the glory, it's the tap with the water in it that is the resource that people need. And we are just perhaps a link, like getting the water from the plant in the hosepipe. And sometimes if the Holy Spirit is not working through us, the problem is at our end. The pipe is kinked. And often the problem at our end is our lack of faith that little humble old me could be used by God to do something beyond our imagination. So let's earnestly desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit and let's earnestly try to work at praying and taking action to come to the place where God's power is released through us. Not just when we come to church, but when we go out to society. So that we can take God's presence with us into the situations we find ourselves. We may get opportunities to present the gospel in various ways, not always just quoting the Bible, but in the way we act in front of our colleagues at work and so forth. But then let's tune into the Holy Spirit so that we can be that hosepipe to bring water where it's needed. Amen.